Hello, everyone, and welcome to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton, and this is Pepper, and today we are going to be continuing our reading of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. When last we left Professor Aranax and the crew of the Nautilus, they had entered the Sargasso Sea and had attempted a marvellous feat, diving deeper than any other manned vessel has ever done before. An intense moment followed where it seemed that the ship might catastrophically contract on itself, crushed like a can underfoot. But at just the right moment, the captain reversed course and the ship shot to the surface. It is there that we catch up with the captain and our narrator, Monsieur Aranax, with chapter... 36. Whales. During the night of March the 13th to the 14th, the Nautilus once again started heading south. I thought that once it got on a parallel with Cape Horn, it would turn west in order to return to the Pacific and finish our tour of the world but it did nothing of the sort, and merely continued in the direction of the Antarctic. I began to think that the captain's rashness justified Ned Land's worst fears. For some time now, the Canadian had said nothing about escaping. He had become less talkative, and now remained silent much of the time. I could see how this prolonged imprisonment weighed on him. Whenever he met the captain, his eyes would gleam with a sullen fire, and I was constantly afraid that his violent instincts would cause him to do something rash. On that day, March the 14th, Conseil and he came to find me in my room. I asked them why they had come. We just want to ask you one question, monsieur. What is it, Ned? How many men do you think there are aboard Sinotlis? I couldn't say. I can't imagine... Ned Land went on, that it would take a very large crew to operate a ship like this. The way it's built, I said, ten men should be enough. Well then, said the Canadian, why should there be more? Why? I retorted, looking fixedly at Ned Land, whose intentions were easy to guess. Because, if my guess is correct, and if I have understood what kind of a man the captain is, the Nautilus is not only a ship, but also a place of refuge for all those who, like the captain, have broken off relations with life on land. Maybe said Conseil. But the Nautilus can only hold a certain number of men, and possibly Monsieur could calculate this maximum. How, Conseil? By working it out mathematically. Given the ship's capacity, which Monsieur knows, and therefore the amount of air it contains, given the quantity of air one man needs for breathing, and comparing these results with the fact that the Nautilus had to surface every 24 hours. Conseil did not finish 
his sentence, but I saw what he was driving at. I understand, I said, but even though this wouldn't be difficult to calculate, the results might only be very approximate. That's all right, said Ned Land insistently. Then here it is, I answered. The amount of oxygen a man uses per hour is equivalent to that contained in a hundred litres of air. And therefore, in twenty-four hours, he would need two thousand four hundred litres of air. So, we have to find out how many times two thousand four hundred litres the Nautilus can contain. Precisely, said Conseil. Now, the capacity of the Nautilus is 1,500 tons, and since there are a 1,000 litres in a ton, the Nautilus contains 1,500,000 litres of air, which divided by 2,400, I made a rapid calculation with a pencil, gives 625. This means that, strictly speaking, the air in the Nautilus would be enough to support... 625 men for 24 hours. 625, repeated Ned. But you can't be certain, I added, that between passengers, sailors, and officers, there isn't one-tenth of that number on board. Set still too much for three men, murmured Conseil. So Ned... I can only advise you to be patient. Not only patient, but resigned, replied Conseil. Conseil had indeed found the right word. After all, he went on, Captain Nemo can't go south forever. He has to stop sometime and come back to more inhabited regions. Then we'll be able to think about escaping again. The Canadian shook his head, rubbed his forehead, and left without saying a word. With monsieur's permission, I would like to point out something, Conseil said. Poor Ned keeps thinking about all the things he can't have. He keeps going over his past life. He frets about everything that's now beyond his reach. His memories weigh on him, and his heart is heavy. We must try to understand how he feels. What is there for him to do here? Nothing. He is not a scientist like Monsieur, and he can't share our delight in all the wonders of the sea. He would risk everything just to be in some tavern in his own country. The monotony of life on board must have been unbearable to the Canadian, accustomed as he was to freedom and activity. Very seldom did anything happen that could really interest him. But nevertheless, that day something occurred which reminded him of his old harpooning days. Toward eleven in the morning, with the Nautilus cruising on the surface, we found ourselves in the midst of a herd of whales. This encounter did not surprise me, for I knew that these creatures had been so mercilessly hunted that they had gone to seek refuge in colder waters. The role played by whales in the sailing world and their influence on geographic discoveries has been considerable. It was while following whales that the first, the Basques, then the Asturians, English and Dutch, learned to brave the dangers of the ocean from one pole to the other. Whales like to frequent Arctic and Antarctic waters, 
ancient legends even claim that these creatures had led whalers to within over only 15 miles of the North Pole. Even though this statement is false, it is poetic and prophetic, for it will probably be through chasing whales into Arctic or Antarctic regions that man will reach one of these unexplored points on the globe. Recall that this book came out in the 1860s, well before man did reach the poles. We were sitting on the platform in the midst of a calm sea. The October of these latitudes had been bringing us lovely weather. It was the Canadian, and he never made mistakes about that sort of thing, who first sighted a whale on the eastern horizon. By looking carefully, I could see its blackish back rise and fall above the surface five miles from the Nautilus. Ah, cried Ned Land, if I were only on board a whither, how what fun this would be. It's a big one. Look what a powerful jet of water it's sending up. Confound it. Why do I have to be chained to this hunk of steel plate? What? You still haven't gotten over your old ideas about fishing, Ned? Can a weather ever forget his old profession? Can a man ever get bored with a job that's so exciting? Have you ever hunted whales in these waters, Ned? Mm, never, monsieur. Only in northern waters, in the Bering Straits and the Davis Straits. So then, you don't know about southern whales. Until now, you've only hunted the right whale, a species that would never venture to cross the warm waters near the equator. What are you trying to tell me, Professor? said the Canadian, in a somewhat incredulous tone of voice. Just what I've said. Rubbish. In 65, that's two and a half years ago, I myself harpooned a wheel of Greenland, and embedded in its body we found another harpoon, with the mark of a whaler from the Bering Sea. Now, I ask you, how could this animal, after being wounded west of America, come to be killed east of America, without crossing the equator and making its way either around the Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope? I agree with Ned, said Conseil, and I'm waiting to see what Monsieur will say. Monsieur will say, my friends, that every species of whale lives within a certain area which it never leaves, and if one of these animals came from the Bering Straits to the Davis Straits, it's quite simply because there exists a passage from one sea to the other, along either the coast of America or of Asia. You wouldn't be pulling my leg? asked the Canadian with a wink. No, Monsieur is being perfectly serious, answered Conseil. In any case, the Canadian went on, since I've never fished in these waters, I don't know what whales are to be found here. That's what I said, Ned. All the more reason to get to know them, retorted Conseil. Oh, look, look, said the Canadian excitedly. It's coming. Oh, it's coming towards us. Oh, it's thumbing its nose at me. It knows I can't do a thing. Ned stamped his foot. He brandished an imaginary harpoon with his trembling hand. Are these whales as big as those in northern waters? Just about, Ned. Because 
I've seen big whales in my day, up to a hundred feet long, and I've even heard tell of a certain kind of whale around the Illusion Islands as it gets up to a hundred and fifty feet long. Hmm. That seems a bit exaggerated, I answered. Those that live around the Illusions belong to the family of Balaenopteridae, which have dorsal fins, and like the sperm whale, are usually smaller than the right whale. Oh, look, cried the Canadian, who hadn't taken his eyes off the ocean. It's coming nearer, right up to the Nautilus. Then he once more took up the thread of the conversation. You talk about sperm whales as if they were small. But I've heard people tell of gigantic sperm whales. They're supposed to be very intelligent. They say that some of them cover themselves with seaweed, and people take them for little islands. People get onto them, set up camp, build a fire, and even build houses said Conseil. Ah, oh, you joker, reported Ned Land. And then one fine day, the creature dies, and all the people living on it drown. <laughs> Just like Sinbad the sailor, I said, laughing. Ah, oh, Master Land, you seem to be awfully fond of tall stories. Those are pretty stupendous sperm whales of yours, I hope you don't believe in them. Professor, the Canadian answered seriously, when it comes to whales, you have to believe just about everything. Look how this one travels. Oh, look how it dives under. They say these animals can go around the world in two weeks. I don't doubt it. But what you undoubtedly don't know, Monsieur Aranax, is that at the beginning of time, these whales could swim even faster than they can now. Oh, really, Ned? Why? Because in the old days they had vertical tails like fish, and they moved them from side to side in the water. But the creator saw that they swam too fast, and it twisted their tails. And from then on, they have had to move their tails up and down in the water, and they haven't been able to swim as fast. You wouldn't be pulling my leg, would you, Ned? I said, using his same expression. <laughs> Not too much, answered Ned Land. No more than if I told you about whales 300 feet long and weighing a hundred thousand pounds. That would be quite a lot, wouldn't it? I said. Nevertheless, it must be said that certain whales reach enormous sizes, since some have been said to have furnished up to a hundred and twenty tons of oil. I've seen them that big, said the Canadian. I believe you, Ned just as I believe that certain whales are equal in size to a hundred elephants. Could you imagine the effect of such a weight travelling at full speed? Is it true, asked Conseil, that they can sink ships? No, or at least I don't think so, I answered. But they say that in 1820... In just these southern waters, a whale rushed at the Essex and pushed it backward at a speed of thirteen feet per second. Water entered astern, and the Essex sank almost immediately. Ned looked at me mockingly. As for me, he said, I have been hit by the tail of one of these animals. It happened in a longboat, of course. My companions and I were thrown twenty feet in the air. But alongside Monsieur's whale, mine was just a baby. Do these animals live a long time? asked Conseil. 
A thousand years, answered the Canadian without hesitation. How do you know that, Ned? Because that's what people say. But why do they say it? Because it's a known fact. No, Ned, it isn't a known fact, but just a supposition. And this is what it's based on. Four hundred years ago, when men first hunted whales, they grew larger than they do now. It's therefore supposed, and rather logically, that the smaller size of present-day whales is due to the fact that they haven't had time to reach their full development. This is what made Buffon say that whales could, and undoubtedly did, live a thousand years. Do you understand? Ned Land didn't understand. He wasn't even listening. The whale was getting closer. He couldn't take his eyes off it. Oh, look, he cried. It isn't just one whale. It's ten, twenty, a whole herd. Oh, to think I have to sit here doing nothing, tied hand and foot. But, Ned, said Conseil, why don't you ask Captain Nemo's permission to hunt them? Conseil hadn't finished his sentence when Ned Land dropped down through the hatch and rushed off in search of the captain. Several moments later, both of them appeared on the platform. Captain Nemo looked at the herd of whales playing in the water a mile or so from the Nautilus. They're black whales, he said, and there are enough of them out there to make a whole fleet of whalers rich. Well, Captain, asked the Canadian, couldn't I go out and hunt them? Oh, if only so I don't forget how to use a harpoon. What good would it do? Answered Captain Nemo. Hunting just to destroy. We have no use for whale oil on board. But, monsieur, said the Canadian, in the Red Sea, you let us hunt a dugong. Then it was a question of getting fresh meat for my crew. Here, it would be killing just for the sake of killing. I know very well that this is one of man's privileges, but I won't permit such murderous pastimes. People like you, Master Land, are very wrong to destroy kind, inoffensive creatures like black whales and right whales. You've already cleared out Baffin Bay, and you're on the way to exterminating a useful class of animals. So, leave these poor whales alone. They have enough trouble with their natural enemies, such as sperm whales, swordfish, and sawfish, without you getting into the act. I leave to the reader to imagine the expression on Ned's face during this little lecture. It was a waste of words to use such arguments with a born hunter. Ned Land looked at Captain Nemo and obviously didn't understand what he meant. Nevertheless, the captain was right. The barbarous, unthinking way these animals are hunted will one day wipe the last whale from the ocean. Ned Land whistled the Yankee Doodle between his teeth, stuck his hands in his pockets, and turned his back to us. After watching the whales for a while, Captain Nemo came over to me and said, I was right to say that whales have enough natural enemies without men trying to kill them off. These whales are soon going to be in trouble. 
Do you see those black dots moving about eight miles to leeward, Monsieur Aranax? Yes, Captain, I answered. Those are sperm whales. Terrible animals. I have sometimes seen them in herds of two or three hundred. They are cruel and destructive, and people are right to kill them. The Canadian turned around brusquely at these last words. Well, Captain, I said, there's still time to help out the black whales. There's no use running any risk, Professor. We can disperse these sperm whales well enough with the Nautilus itself. It has a steel spur on its prow that I imagine is just as effective as Master Land's harpoon. The Canadian didn't even bother shrugging his shoulders. The idea of attacking whales with a ship's prow? Who had ever heard of such a thing? In a few minutes, Monsieur Aronnax, said Captain Nemo, you will see such hunting as you've never seen before. We will give them no quarter. These ferocious whales are nothing but mouth and teeth. Mouth and teeth. There was no better way to describe the sperm whale, which sometimes exceeds 80 feet in length. Its huge head takes up roughly a third of its body. It is better armed than the ordinary whale, whose upper jaw is only furnished with whalebone, for it has twenty-five large teeth, eight inches high, round and cone-shaped on top, which weigh about two pounds apiece. Inside the upper part of the creature's head there are big cavities, separated by cartilage, which contain up to eight or nine hundred pounds of that precious whale oil, called spermaceti. The sperm whale is a very ungraceful animal, shaped more like a tadpole than a fish, as Fridol put it. It is badly built, being more or less defective on its left side, with the result that its sight is almost totally confined to its right eye. Meanwhile, the whole huge herd was drawing nearer. They had noticed the black whales and were preparing to attack. I knew that the sperm whales would win, not only because they were better adapted for fighting than their harmless adversaries, but also because they could stay longer underwater without coming to the surface to breathe. There was no time to be lost in going to the rescue of the black whales. The Nautilus dove. Conseil, Ned, and I took our places by the glass panels in the lounge. Captain Nemo went up to the helmsman's compartment to wield his ship like a weapon. Soon I could feel our speed increasing. The struggle between the sperm whales and the black whales had already begun when the Nautilus arrived on the scene. It manoeuvred in such a way as to cut off the sperm whales. At first they seemed to pay no attention to the new monster which had joined the fray, but soon they found they had met their match. What a fight! Even Ned Land became enthusiastic and began clapping his hands. The Nautilus had become a formidable harpoon brandished by the hand of its captain. It would hurl itself against one of these massive creatures and run clean through it, leaving behind two twisting halves of a whale. The submarine was impervious to the blows of their powerful tails. Nor did we even notice the impact when it struck a whale. Once it had killed one, it would rush on to the next, turning so as not to miss its prey, going forward and backward, obedient to its helm, diving when a whale went deep, and coming back up with it when it surfaced, striking it full on or obliquely, 
cutting it in two or merely tearing it open and piercing with its terrible spur in any direction or at any speed. What carnage! What a noise on the surface! What sharp hissings and strange roars these terrified animals let out! Lower down, where the water is usually so calm, their tails churned up the sea as if a storm were raging. This Homeric massacre went on for an hour, and there was no way the sperm whales could escape. Several times ten or twelve of them got together and tried to crush the Nautilus with their weight. Through the glass panels we could see their huge mouths full of teeth and their formidable eyes. Ned Land was beside himself, menacing and cursing them. We could feel them, clinging to the side of the submarine, like dogs seizing a wild boar. But the Nautilus would nearly put on speed, and either drag them along or force them back up to the surface, indifferent both to their enormous weight and the power of their huge jaws. Finally, the herd of sperm whales began to thin out. The waters once again became calm. I could feel the ship surfacing. The hatch was opened and we rushed out on the platform. The sea was covered with mutilated carcasses. A powerful explosion could not have torn open these huge creatures more violently. We were floating amid gigantic humped bodies which, with bluish backs and white bellies. Several terrified sperm whales were fleeing out toward the horizon. The water had turned red for several miles in either direction, and the Nautilus was floating on a sea of blood. Captain Nemo rejoined us. Well, Master Land, he said. Well, monsieur, answered the Canadian, whose enthusiasm had by now died down. There is no doubt about it. It was a terrible sight. But I'm a hunter, not a butcher, and this was nothing but a massacre. It was a massacre of harmful animals, answered the captain. The Nautilus is not a butcher knife. I prefer my harpoon, retorted the Canadian. Each man to his own weapon, answered the captain, looking fixedly at Ned Land. I feared Ned might get carried away and do something violent, which would have had serious consequences for us. But his anger was distracted by the sight of a whale floating near the Nautilus. It was one which had not been able to escape from the sperm whales. I recognised the black or southern whale with its compressed head. Anatomically it was distinguished from the right whale and the northern cape whale by the fact that its seven cervical vertebrae are joined together and that it has two more ribs. This poor creature was dead, lying on its side with its belly bitten open. A baby whale, which the mother had not been able to save from the massacre, still hung on to her mutilated fin. The water ran in her mouth and over her whalebone, like a murmuring undertow. Captain Nemo brought the Nautilus alongside the cadaver. Two of his men got off onto the whale and, to my great surprise, started milking her. 
By the time they were through, they had enough to fill two or three casks. The captain offered me a glass of this still warm milk. I could not refrain from showing my distaste for this sort of drink, but he assured me that it was not only excellent, but indistinguishable from cow's milk. I tasted it, and was forced to agree with him. It therefore provided us with a useful reserve stock, for this milk, in the form of salted butter or cheese, brought a pleasant change in our usual diet. From that day on, I began to worry about Ned Land, for I noticed that his ill will toward Captain Nemo was increasing. I resolved to keep a close watch on the Canadian. Chapter 37 The Great Ice Barrier The Nautilus once again took up its steady southern course. It followed the 50th meridian, travelling at considerable speed. Did the captain want to try to reach the South Pole? I did not think so, for till then every attempt to reach it had failed. Moreover, it was already nearly too late in the season, for the 13th of March in the Antarctic corresponds to the 13th of September in the northern regions. On the 14th of March, I saw floating ice near 55 degrees south latitude, but it was no more than bits or pieces 20 to 25 feet long, forming reefs against which the sea broke into foam. The Nautilus stayed on the surface. To Ned Land, who had already fished in Arctic waters, icebergs were a familiar sight, but Conseil and I were admiring them for the first time. Toward the southern horizon, there was a shining white streak in the sky. English whalers have named it Ice Blink. No matter how many clouds there are, it is never hidden from view. It announces the presence of a pack or bank of ice. And in fact, we soon began to see real icebergs, shining with a brilliance which varied according to the changing mist. Some of them contained green veins, as if streaked with wavy lines of copper sulphate. Others seemed like enormous transparent amethysts, reflecting the sunlight in the thousand facets of their crystals. Others, tinted by the limestone they contained, would have supplied enough marble to construct a city. The farther south we went, the more numerous and large these icebergs became. Polar birds were nesting on them by the thousands. There were petrels and puffins deafening us with their cries. Some of them, mistaking the Nautilus for the body of a dead whale, would alight on its deck and try pecking its steel plates. While we were navigating among these icebergs, Captain Nemo remained on deck a good deal of the time. He was carefully observing these deserted waters. Every now and then I would see his calm eyes light up. Was he saying to himself that since the Antarctic was closed off to other men, he was at home and master of these impassable spaces? Perhaps. But he said nothing. He remained immobile, only coming out of his reverie when his helmsman's instincts finally got the upper hand. He then took the wheel and guided the ship with consummate skill, cleverly avoiding collisions with these masses of ice, some of which were several miles long, and 200 to 250 feet high. Often the horizon seemed completely blocked. When, finally, we had reached the 60th degree of south latitude, every passageway had disappeared. But after a careful search, Captain Nemo soon bravely maneuvered the ship into a narrow opening, 
knowing only too well that it would close in behind him. Thus the Nautilus, guided by his skillful hand, passed through all that ice which, to Conseil's delight, has been classified with great precision according to its shape and size. There are icebergs, which are shaped like mountains, ice fields stretching out in vast, unbroken plains, drift ice, or floating ice, and ice packs, called palks, when they are round, and streams, when they are arranged in elongated strips. The temperature was quite low. The outside thermometer registered between 27 and 28 degrees Fahrenheit. But we were warmly dressed in clothes made of seal or polar bear fur. The inside of the Nautilus was heated by its electrical apparatus and could maintain an even temperature against the severest cold. Moreover, we merely had to dive several fathoms down to find a more comfortable temperature. Two months earlier, in these latitudes, we would have had a period of perpetual daylight, but now there were already three or four hours of night, and later on, six months of darkness would descend on these regions around the pole. But March 15th, we had passed the latitude of the South Shetland and South Orkney Islands. The captain told me that large herds of seals used to inhabit these islands, but that English and American whalers, in their rage for destruction, had massacred the adult males and pregnant females, and left behind them the silence of death. Toward eight in the morning of March the 16th, the Nautilus, cruising along the 55th meridian, crossed the Antarctic Circle. We were so surrounded by ice that the horizon was hidden from view. Nevertheless, Captain Nemo went from one passageway to the next, always heading south. Where do you suppose he's going? I asked. Straight ahead, replied Conseil. After all, when he can't go any further, he'll stop. I wouldn't swear to that. I said. And to be frank, I did not dislike the idea of this new adventure on which we had embarked. I cannot describe the beauties of this new region. The ice took on extraordinary shapes. Here it would look like an oriental town with its innumerable minarets and mosques. There, like a ruined city, destroyed by some earthquake, the scenery was constantly varied by the sun's oblique rays, or lost in grey mists or blizzards. From all sides came the sound of icebergs cracking apart, crumbling, or falling over. If the Nautilus happened to be cruising underwater when these things took place, the sound would travel through the ocean with indescribable intensity and these masses of falling ice would create a backwash which could be felt to the deepest parts of the ocean. The Nautilus would then roll and pitch like a ship at the mercy of the elements. Often I could see no way out and thought we would be imprisoned forever, but guided by his instinct, Captain Nemo would find tiny openings and lead us into new passageways. He never erred in picking out the tiny threads of bluish water running through the ice fields. I therefore felt sure he had already sailed the Nautilus through Antarctic waters. Nevertheless, on March the 16th, our path was finally completely blocked by ice. We had not yet reached the great ice barrier but we were among vast ice fields cemented together by the cold. This obstacle, however, did not stop Captain Nemo, 
and he sent the Nautilus hurtling against the ice with incredible violence. The submarine entered this brittle mass like a wedge and split it open with terrible cracking sounds. It was like a battering ram with infinite power behind it. Pieces of ice were thrown high in the air and then fell around us like hail. Our ship carved out a path for itself by brute force. Occasionally its momentum would be such that it would rise up on top of the ice field and then crush it beneath its weight. Or sometimes, when it became embedded within the ice field, it would split it open by pitching back and forth. During this time, we were assaulted by violent squalls. Then there would be fogs, so thick we could not see from one end of the platform to the other. Sudden winds would spring up from any point of the compass. Snow would pile up so deep and compact on the ship that it would have to be chipped off with pickaxes. The temperature would only have to go down to 23 degrees for the whole outside of the Nautilus to become covered with ice. Rigging would have been unusable, for all the tackle would have become frozen. Only a ship without sails and propelled by electricity could venture into these latitudes. During this whole period, the barometer remained very low. Moreover, the compass no longer gave reliable readings. Its needle would madly point in all directions as we got nearer the South Magnetic Pole, which must not be confused with the South Pole itself. In fact, according to Hanston, the Magnetic Pole is situated about 70 degrees south latitude and 130 degrees longitude, and according to Duperry's observations, at 135 degrees longitude and 70 degrees and 30 minutes south latitude. We therefore had to take numerous readings on compasses placed in different parts of the ship and then take a mean. But often we could only chart our route by guesswork, a highly unsatisfactory method in the midst of these winding passageways among the continually shifting landmarks. Finally, on March the 18th, after 20 useless assaults, the Nautilus found itself completely blocked. This was no longer an ice stream, pulch, or ice field, but an interminable, immobile chain of mountains welded together. It's a great ice barrier, said the Canadian. I realized that for Ned Land, as well as for all the other sailors who had preceded us, this was the impassable obstacle. Toward noon, the sun appeared for a moment and permitted Captain Nemo to obtain a fairly exact reading for our position. 51 degrees and 30 minutes west longitude and 67 degrees and 39 minutes south latitude. We were already far into Antarctic regions. Before we could no longer see any water, uh, before us, we could no longer see any water. Beyond the Nautilus's prow stretched a vast plain, twisted and tangled in a confused mass of ice. It had the capricious, helter-skelter look of the surface of a river just before the ice breaks up but on a gigantic scale. Here and there were sharp peaks rising like thin needles 200 feet into the air. Farther on, a row of sheer greyish cliffs reflected the sun's rays like huge mirrors lost in the mist. And over this desolate expanse reigned a grim silence, only occasionally broken by the wingbeat of petrels or puffins. Everything, even sound, was frozen. Here the Nautilus was forced to halt in its daring journey 
through the ice field. Monsieur, said Ned Land, if that captain of yours goes any farther... What then, Ned? <laughs> Why, then he's a superman. Why, Ned? Because no one can cross the great ice barrier. Captain Nemo might be quite a man, but he can't overcome nature. And where nature tells you to stop, you have to stop, whether you like it or not. You're right, Ned. But all the same, I'd like to know what's behind that wall. Nothing infuriates me more than a barrier. Monsieur's right, said Conseil. Walls were invented to frustrate scientists. There shouldn't be walls anywhere. But that's all very fine, said the Canadian. But anyone can tell you what you'll find behind this barrier. What? I asked. Ice. And more ice. I'm not so sure about that, Ned. That's why I would like to go farther. Give up that idea, Professor, replied the Canadian. You've gotten as far as the Great Ice Barrier. That should be enough. Even with Captain Nemo and his Nautilus, you won't get any farther. And whether he wants to or not, he'll have to head back north, where normal people live. I must admit that Ned Land was right, and until they make ships that can sail over ice fields, they will have to stop before the Great Ice Barrier. And true enough, in spite of its efforts and its powerful means of splitting ice, the Nautilus had become completely hemmed in. Ordinarily, if one does not want to go any farther, one can merely turn back. But here, turning back was as impossible as going forward, for all passengers had closed in behind us. Although we were now merely hemmed in, the submarine would soon become embedded in the ice. And this is what began happening toward two in the afternoon, when new ice formed along the sides of the ship with astonishing speed. I had to admit that Captain Nemo's conduct had been exceedingly rash. I was, then, on the platform. The captain, who had been watching the situation for several moments, said to me, Well, Professor, what do you think of our situation? I think we're trapped, Captain. Trapped? What do you mean? I mean that we can't go forward, backward, or sideways. I think that's what's meant by trapped in the inhabited parts of the Earth. So, Monsieur Aranax, you think the Nautilus won't be able to get free? It will be very difficult, Captain, for it's already too late in the year to be able to count on the ice breaking up. Oh, Professor, replied Captain Nemo, in an ironic tone of voice. You'll always be the same. You'll never see anything but difficulties and obstacles. But let me say that not only will the Nautilus free herself, but she will take us even farther. Farther south? I asked, looking at the captain. Yes, monsieur, to the South Pole. To the South Pole, I cried, unable to repress a gesture of disbelief. Yes, the captain answered coldly. To the South Pole, that unknown point where all the meridians of the globe meet. As you know, I can make the Nautilus do what I want. Yes, that much I did know. I also knew that this man was brave, to the point of being foolhardy. But the South Pole, 
it was surrounded by many more obstacles than the North Pole, which even the bravest navigators had not yet reached. To go there would be absolutely mad. It was an idea that could only arise in the mind of a crazy man. I then got the idea of asking the captain if he had already discovered the South Pole. No, monsieur, he answered, but we will discover it together. Where others have failed, I shall succeed. I have never taken my Nautilus this far south, but I repeat, she will go yet farther. I would like to believe you, Captain, I said, in a somewhat ironic tone of voice. In fact, it ought to be easy. No obstacles too great for us. We'll just smash the barrier. We'll blow it up. And if we can't blow it up, we'll put wings on the Nautilus and fly over it. Over it, Professor? Captain Nemo replied calmly. No, not over it. But under it. Under it, I cried. Suddenly, I realized what the captain had in mind. I understood what he was going to do. The Nautilus's marvelous powers were once again going to be employed in a superhuman undertaking. I think we're beginning to understand each other, Professor, said the captain, half smiling. You're beginning to see the possibility, or the success as I prefer to think of it, of this attempt. Things you cannot do with an ordinary ship become easy with the Nautilus. If there is a continent at the pole, we will be forced to stop before this continent. But if, on the contrary, there is open ocean there, we will sail to the very pole. That's right, I said carried away by the captain's reasoning, for although the surface of the sea is frozen, the water, deep down, must be free, for the heaven-sent reason that the maximum density of water occurs at two degrees above freezing point. And unless I'm mistaken, the submerged portion of this barrier is in a ratio of four to one to the part above water. Very nearly, Professor, for every foot of an iceberg that is above water, there are three feet below. Now, since none of these mountains of ice are higher than 300 feet, they won't go deeper than 900 feet into the water. And what is 900 feet to the Nautilus? Nothing, Captain. It could even go deeper to find that area of temperature common to all oceans, and there we would be completely impervious to the thirty or forty degrees below zero on the surface. Absolutely, Captain, I said, becoming more animated. The only difficulty, Captain Nemo continued, will be to remain submerged for several days without renewing our air supply. Is that the only difficulty? I retorted. The Nautilus has vast reservoirs, which can be filled and thereby furnish us with all the oxygen we'll need. Well thought out, Monsieur Aronnax, replied the captain with a smile, but since I don't want you to accuse me of being rash, I am reminding you in advance of all my objections. Are there any others? Only one. If there is water at the South Pole, it's possible that it will be entirely frozen over, and that we would, therefore, be unable to surface. But, Captain, you're forgetting that the Nautilus is armed with a powerful spur. Why couldn't we come up under these ice fields from below and break them open? Uh, professor, you're full of ideas today. Moreover, Captain, I added, working with a pitch of enthusiasm. 
Why shouldn't there be open water at the South Pole, just as there is at the North Pole? The poles of coal and those of the Earth are not the same, either in the Arctic or the Antarctic. And until we have proof to the contrary, we must suppose that these two points, there is either land or open ocean. I think so too, Monsieur Aronnax, replied Captain Nemo. Let me merely remark that, after raising so many objections to my plan, you are now flooding me with arguments in its favour. This was true. I was getting bolder than he. I was the one persuading him to go to the pole. I was the leader, the man willing to... No. Stop your daydreaming, you poor fool. Captain Nemo knew better than you the pros and cons of the question. He was just playing a game with you, watching you be carried away with visions of the impossible. Meanwhile... He did not lose a moment. He signalled, and the first mate appeared. The two of them spoke rapidly in their incomprehensible language. And either because the first mate had been warned beforehand, or because he considered the project reasonable, he showed no surprise. But as impassive as he may have been, he could not compare with Conseil when I told him of our intent to push on to the South Pole. As an answer, I received a mere, as monsieur wishes, and had to be content with that. As for Ned Land, he gave the largest shrug I've ever seen. Believe me, monsieur, he said, I feel sorry for you and your Captain Nemo. But we'll reach the South Pole, Ned. Maybe but you won't come back. And then Ned Land went back to his cabin, so he wouldn't do something desperate, as he said upon leaving. Meanwhile, the ship was made ready for this bold attempt. The Nautilus's powerful pumps brought air into the reservoirs and stored it there under high pressure. Toward four o'clock, Captain Nemo announced that the hatches leading to the platform would be closed. I took one last look at the thick barrier we were about to cross. The sky was clear, and the air pure and cold. It was ten degrees above zero. But now that the wind had died down, this temperature did not seem too unbearable. Ten or so men got onto the sides of the Nautilus and broke the ice around the hull with pickaxes. Soon we were free. It took little time, for the new ice was still thin. We all went back inside. The reservoirs were filled with the water that had not frozen around the hull, and the Nautilus started down. I and Conseil had taken up our posts in the lounge. Through the open panels we looked out into the waters of this southern sea. The thermometer rose. The needle on the pressure gauge started moving down. As Captain Nemo had predicted, at about 900 feet we found ourselves floating beneath the undulating surface of the barrier. But the Nautilus went yet farther down. We finally stopped at a depth of 2,600 feet. The temperature of the water had risen two degrees, from ten degrees at the surface to twelve at this depth. It goes without saying that the temperature inside the Nautilus, maintained by its heating devices, was much higher than this. Every operation was carried out with extraordinary precision. If Monsieur will permit me to say so, I think we will pass the ice barrier, said Conseil. I'm sure we will, I answered, with deep conviction. Now that it was in open water, the Nautilus headed straight for the South Pole, cruising along the 52nd meridian. We had to go from 67 degrees and 30 minutes 
to 90 degrees, 22 and a half degrees of latitude, or more than a thousand miles. The Nautilus was travelling at an average of 26 knots, the speed of an express train. If it kept going at this rate, we would be there in 40 hours. The novelty of our situation kept Conseil and me at the glass panels of the lounge for a good part of the night. The sea was lit up by the electric light, but it was empty. No fish lived in these imprisoned waters. For them, it was only a way of getting from the Antarctic Ocean to the open water around the pole. We were travelling fast, and the long steel hull trembled as it sped through the water. Toward two in the morning, I went to get several hours of sleep. Conseil did the same. As I went down the gangway, I did not meet Captain Nemo. I suppose he was at the helm. At five on the following morning, I went back to my post in the lounge. The electric log showed that we had reduced our speed. The Nautilus was cautiously returning toward the surface, emptying its reservoirs slowly. My heart was beating fast. Were we going to come up and find ourselves in open water near the South Pole? No. A sudden thud told me that the Nautilus had struck the underside of the ice barrier, which was still very thick, judging by the dead sound of the blow. We had, in fact, touched ground, to use a nautical term, but upside down and at a depth of a thousand feet. This meant that there were 1,333 feet of ice above us, 330 feet of which were above the surface. The barrier was slightly higher here than it was at the edge. Not a very comforting thought. The Nautilus tried the same experiment several times that day, and every time it was stopped short by the wall overhead. In certain places it met ice at a depth of 3,000 feet, which meant that the ice was 4,000 feet thick, with a 1,000 feet protruding above the surface. This was three times the height of the barrier at the point where the Nautilus had first gone under. I carefully noted these various depths, and I was thus able to obtain an underwater outline of this icy mountain chain. That evening, our situation remained unchanged. We continued to find ice at varying depths from 1,300 to 1,600 feet. This was an improvement, but there was still quite a distance between us and the surface of the ocean. It was then 8 o'clock. At 4 o'clock the air should have been renewed in the Nautilus, according to the usual custom on board. But I was not feeling the lack of it too much, even though Captain Nemo had not started using his reserve supply. I slept fitfully that night. I was assailed by hopes and fears. I got up several times. The Nautilus continued trying to break through. Toward three in the morning, I noticed that we met the underside of the barrier at a depth of only a hundred and fifty feet. The barrier was, little by little, turning back into an ice field. The mountains were changing into plains. My eyes remained fixed on the pressure gauge. We kept climbing, following the underside of the ice, which sparkled beneath the rays of the electric light. Slowly but surely, the barrier was getting thinner. Finally, at six in the morning, on that memorable day of March 19th, the door of the lounge opened. Captain Nemo entered and said, Open water. And that, my friends, is where we will end our reading for today. This part was simultaneously, or I suppose, 
varyingly, depending upon which chapter we're talking about. Quite exciting, and also a little bleak. The descriptions of violence against the sperm whales is not something that I particularly enjoyed reading. I hope that it was not too disquieting for any of you out there, and I apologize for not warning you in advance. I hope, though, that you did enjoy this fanciful journey to the South Pole, for, as you may know, this is an invention of the writer. Uh, when Jules Verne wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, as he says, no person had ever been to the South Pole. And we now know that Antarctica is a continent. There is land. And so our explorations, uh, or at least the Nautilus's explorations, would have been met with that land barrier that they mentioned as a possibility, rather than the ring of ice which surrounds the South Pole in the story. It's always fun for me to see what the author knows and what the author doesn't. Uh, Jules Verne obviously has an encyclopedic knowledge of undersea life and scientific figures of his own time, but a lot has changed in the last 150 years since this book was written. It's fascinating to see what has changed in our scientific understanding of the world, just as what has changed in our cultural understanding of the world, something that we have talked about a little bit in prior parts of this series. I hope that you too are enjoying that trip through science, through history, and through fantasy with 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea here on Soft Stories. I must leave you now, but I look forward to our next part, where we see what really, wink, lies at the South Pole. Until next we meet, I must bid you farewell, but I wish you all the best. Goodbye.